Have you ever wondered what it was like on Earth after the extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs, along with three quarters of all species alive at that dramatic moment 66 million years ago? I have, many times, envisioned a destroyed Earth, all surface vegetation burned to cinders, atmospheric dust and ash blocking the sunlight, ushering in a cold impact winter with a few small, desperate creatures eking out a meager existence, waiting out the catastrophe to survive. So, of course, I was fascinated by the dramatic recent discoveries at a place called Corral Bluffs near Colorado Springs, Colorado, that reveal the remarkable process of recovery and the blossoming of an entire ecosystem over the million years or so after the mass extinction. Just to set the stage, 66 million years ago, the Earth experienced its most famous mass extinction event, the one that eradicated three quarters of all species, 90% of life alive at the time, including all non-avian dinosaurs, the dominant terrestrial vertebrates for some 150 million years before their end. Evidence for a giant impact event by an asteroid or meteorite is substantial and generally believed to have played a major role in what is technically called the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event and the Chicxulub Crater off the Yucatan Peninsula for most geologists is the smoking gun. Volcanic activity in the Deccan Traps in India may have contributed but in any case, this was the most important event to have occurred on Earth in the last 60 million years because it dramatically altered the course of life on Earth. Without the extinction event, it is beyond improbable to think that we humans would exist at all. The event cleared the way for a new group to occupy the ecological niches abandoned by the death of the dinosaurs. That group? The mammals, of which we humans are a relatively recently arrived member. The story of these new findings by paleontologist Tyler Lyson of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and colleagues was recently well told in a PBS Nova episode, The Rise of the Mammals. And the visual presentation of these findings in the program is striking and copyrighted, so you might want to have a look. And while I can't show you those visuals, what I can do is to present the most important parts of the story and try to put it into some perspective. And it is a fascinating story of a fast-moving process. The focus of many estimates of recovery after the extinction event is the time to return to pre-extinction levels of biodiversity. And they generally assign numbers from a few million to some tens of millions of years for that to have happened. The present study is different. It makes no claims about levels of biodiversity, but instead paints a vivid and convincing picture of the return of plant, insect, and mammalian life after the apocalyptic destruction 66 million years ago. We'll get there in a minute, but first a word about what grounded these dramatic new findings. It was the hard work of Lyson and colleagues to establish reliable dating of the strata at Corral Bluffs, something which had proved difficult previously. The crucial method that nailed down the dating of layers of rock was a precise paleomagnetic dating of the layers, also called magnetic polarity stratigraphy. What does this mean? Geomagnetic reversals are shifts in the polarity of the Earth's magnetic field. Our compasses now point to the north, but there have been many times in the past when the polarity has shifted, and during those times a compass would have pointed south. Some rocks and sediments, and especially basalts from ocean floor spreading, retain a detectable record of the magnetic polarity at the time they were laid down, and careful study has established a worldwide record of magnetic reversals. If you can date one stratum by other means, radioisotope dating for example, 
the pattern of magnetic reversals in nearby rocks can establish the age of that stratum. Why does the Earth undergo periodic magnetic polarity reversals? We don't know. But there have been 183 such reversals over the last 83 million years. Through laborious work, Lyson and colleagues were able to establish polarity shifts that establish something very rare on Earth that there are sections of rock at Corral Bluffs that date to the one million years after the extinction event 66 million years ago. And the location of fossils within those layers allows for an accurate dating of those fossils. Back to our story. Rather than telling the whole thing at once, let's first look at the most dramatic finds, the mammalian discoveries. And then after that, we can talk about the expansive perspective that these findings provide about the recovering ecosystem as a whole. Before the extinction event, mammals had been around for over 150 million years, about, about as long as the dinosaurs. It was once thought that they were limited to small shrew-like insectivores. But more recently, it's been recognized that there were a range of mammalian adaptations and that the largest mammalian species pre-extinction were at least the size of small dogs. Before the asteroid strike, Lyson says that the largest mammals at Corral Bluffs were the size of a raccoon. Immediately after impact, the largest mammals found were about rat-sized. But within a hundred thousand years, a new raccoon-sized mammal had emerged. Artists' renderings of the mammals that were found at Corral Bluffs have been made available. By 300,000 years post-apocalypse, investigators found two larger mammals. One was a mammal called Loxolophus. At least that's my best shot at pronouncing it. At around 13 pounds in weight. Now teeth are often a very useful indicator about what fossilized animals were eating. And Loxolophus teeth were very adaptable with sharp front teeth suitable for tearing material and flatter back teeth useful for grinding plant material. So this was an animal well adapted to a mixed diet. A generalist. Able to survive on whatever was available. Quite possibly a scavenger. Scarcity favored the adaptable rather than the specialist dependent on one or just a few food sources. But also at around 300,000 years after the apocalypse, a larger mammal thrived, Carcioptichus. Beaver-sized, around 45 pounds, notable for its large teeth, generally associated with grinding plants, stems, and leaves. Carcioptichus is the first mammal found after impact to show signs of specialization. This is a clear indication in itself that the forests were recovering as the adaptive driver of this specialization would have been the increased availability of plants to eat. Carcioptichus was larger than any mammal that lived before the extinction event. At 700,000 years after the extinction event in the upper layers of Corral Bluffs, two large mammalian species were found. The first Teniolabus weighed some 80 pounds, 10 times the size of the generalist found at 100,000 years post-extinction event. It had large incisors reminiscent of beaver teeth and lived around riverbeds and at 100 pounds, almost wolf-sized. Eoconodon lived with flat back teeth and a new food source, which I'll mention in a moment. This photo of the range of skulls at Corral Bluffs gives you a sense of the burgeoning size of mammals over a 600,000 year period. From the tiny scavenger Loxolophus at the left to the large Teniolabus and Eoconodon at the right. The emergence of these mammalian species is the headline-grabbing discovery here, but it's really not the most fundamental aspect of the Corral Bluff discoveries. 
That distinction belongs to the totality of the findings. Corral Bluffs preserves an entire ecosystem, not just mammals, but the emerging plants, insects, and mammals that together paint a picture of recovery and emergence of an entire habitat after catastrophe. And Lyson and colleagues, using an examination of fossil plants, spores, pollen grains, and animal fossils, have been able to associate the recovery of plant life with the emergence of increasingly large and specialized mammals. For example, after a catastrophe, there is usually a first growth of fungus feeding on the dead. After that, and seen at corral bluffs, is what is known as a fern spike. Ferns are often the first plants to return after a disaster. They reproduce by spores rather than by spreading seeds or pollen. And spores are usually produced in higher numbers than seeds. They're small, making dispersal by wind effective, and they have minimal requirements, in particular the presence of sunlight for photosynthesis to colonize an area. Spores at Corral Bluffs show an early fern spike, implying that ferns were probably a major food source for mammals at 100,000 years post-apocalypse. The warming of Earth over hundreds of thousands of years allowed the proliferation of new plants. We see the significant return of forests by 300,000 years, and the plant-eating adaptation in the teeth of Carcioptichus appear to be taking advantage of this newly available food source, even as the small generalist scavenger Loxolophus persisted. Finally, a dramatic discovery was made correlated in time with the emergence of the larger mammals. At 700,000 years post-apocalypse, legumes appear in the fossil record along with their pods. These are new and significant sources of protein. The earliest legume emergence is simultaneous with the expansion in size of mammals. Eoconodon and Teniolabus are likely feasting on this new nutritional source, driving the evolution of larger, more specialized mammals. At Corral Bluffs, we see the recovery of plants driving the evolution of mammals. Apocalypse. Catastrophe. Impact winter. But then Earth warmed again. Forests returned. The mammalian and insect generalists present early in this process gave way to more and more specialization as food options became more plentiful. Mammals took advantage of the new nutritional options and in combination with the opportunity presented by empty ecological niches abandoned with the extinction of the dinosaurs, the age of dinosaurs gave way to the age of mammals. Mammals underwent a dramatic adaptive radiation in response, eventually coming to occupy every climate, every continent, achieving an astonishing variability in morphology, lifestyle, and location. And of particular interest to us, the elaboration of mammals ultimately led to a diversification of primates, which tens of millions of years later produced great apes and human beings. Corral Bluffs is one special location where we see with exceptional vividness the rebirth of an entire ecosystem after catastrophe. It stands as a testimony to the remarkable resilience of the natural world and to the inventiveness of evolution. Some suggest that a new mass extinction may be underway. At the very least, we're seeing very elevated extinction rates with the loss of populations and habitats the alteration of the chemical composition of the atmosphere and the warming of the planet. We should be vigilant about studying and understanding these changes and taking action to stop and remedy human contribution to what is already a serious problem. And we don't want to find out what will happen if we don't act. 
But the 65 million year story of Corral Bluffs has something to say about this matter as well. And that is, even if the planet as we have known it changes radically, and even if those changes catastrophically lead to an Earth not supportive of a human future, something I am not necessarily predicting, and I remain optimistic that we will find our way through this. But even in that extreme and grim circumstance, the Corral Bluff story is a powerful argument that life itself will continue, will thrive perhaps in some other form, whether or not our kind are around to observe it. Be sure to subscribe, hit the notification button, and thanks a lot for watching.